Hey guys, Youngblood with you for the 42nd episode of The Inbox, and this time we're going to go ahead and start off with a question from Field Smith. He says, what do you think CIG is going to do to counter the duplication of ships? For example, if my ship is stolen by pirates, they can now claim ownership of that ship and use it freely outside of the UEE protected space. Or at least I think that's what CIG is planning to make possible. And if I have insurance on my ship, will I get a replacement after a certain amount of time has passed? What mechanics do you think are going to be put in place to prevent players from doing this? I know that the money we put towards these ships now is a pledge to make the game better, um, but if we're paying hundreds of dollars for these ships early, then what's stopping someone with an Aurora starter package from stealing my $300 ship and taking it his, his own uh, as soon as CIG makes it possible to do so in the PTU or PU? Sorry for the long question, STL. Love your videos. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I, this is actually a planned game mechanic. Um, you know, there are going to be people that decide to get into the game as cheap as possible and then work on stealing ships and then just continuing to um, increase. Now, as far as what is CIG going to do to counter that, um, it, there's nothing in the game that's going to necessarily be a direct counter because it's planned. Um, you know, if you think about things today, technically somebody could steal your car. Insurance that you have on that vehicle is going to replace it, so you're going to have it as well as whoever stole your car. Um, but much like in real life, um, the police are going to be looking for that person. And if it comes up as a stolen vehicle, the police are probably going to be uh, trying to, uh, you know, collect that vehicle and arrest that person. We're going to see that in Star Citizen as well. You know, if uh, that person decides to come back into UEE space, that vehicle's probably going to be labeled as hot. Now, we know there's going to be things in-game, or at least have been mentioned about being in-game, um, like the ability to kind of uh, hack or change out your transponder in your vehicle so it actually registers as something else. But somebody's going to actually have to find somebody that's capable of doing that and pay to make that happen. Um, not to mention, if you know who stole your ship, you may be able to just put your own bounty on that person and not on that ship specifically. Um, it's also going to be kind of a limiting factor because it's going to be restricted to where they can go now you know they could come into Terra which is going to be a highly protected area um, but they're either going to be wanted or have to take the necessary precautions when they end up arriving so yeah, there's nothing really in place now there's going to be some changes that are probably going to make it harder for people to actually steal ships like right now somebody can run out to the landing pad get in your ship and fly off and that's a pretty minor issue considering there's not really persistence in regards to that at this moment um, that being said, you know, there's things that we know that are going to be coming, like the ability to, like, lock your ship on the landing pad. So things are coming that are going to help to kind of balance it out. But since this is really more of a planned feature, um, you know, it's just something you're going to have to be cognizant of. And people are going to try and steal your ship. People are going to try and steal your cargo. Um, and some people are really, really going to hate pirates. And I actually kind of like having them in the game because it helps to provide a really dynamic and interesting universe that we're playing in, as well as some of that emergent and exciting gameplay. Um, Milanko877 says, Hey, STL Youngblood, love watching your videos, and I love your opinions on how the game is getting developed, and as well as you should buy, or should you buy videos. Thank you. Uh, I wanted your opinion on how long you think it would take to plan and execute an event that was planned by an organization, for example, a hauling expedition. I have kids in a full-time job, and I've played games where this was a lot, or where there was a lot of time wasted by joking around and waiting for people, and sometimes by the time the event gets started, I end up having to log off. I was hoping you can give an example of how it would work in your org. Um, I, I sympathize there. Um, you know, newer parent, I've got a pretty demanding full-time job. Um, you know, we've got family and friend obligations as well. So it, the playtime is challenging. Now, one thing that's coming that's going to be helpful in this regards is the um, kind of the up, the organization 2.0 or 1.0 or whatever the update's going to be. I know they changed the vernacular on it. Um, but the ability to interact with people from the website to in-game means that you can do some collaborative efforts without actually having to be in the game. Um, I think in our organization, we're probably going to have some people that are going to be doing things like uh, financial um, type work or kind of like planners. Um, people that are taking a look at the uh, exploration data that we've captured and the uh, planned routes. Um, you know, maybe we've got people running around and looking at market analysis and saying, okay, if we buy here and sell here, we're going to maximize our profits. So there may be people that can spend more time in game or they're just dedicating their time in game to do that to help the organization as a whole. So when we do get an organizational exped expedition in place, we know ahead of time what we're getting into. So I think some of that planning is going to be helpful. Um, I think hopefully we're going to get some utilities that will actually work off the website, or I mean out of the game. Um, a good example was uh, in Elite Dangerous, there was actually a websites that showed like market values that were updated by the community. So you knew like what routes you could take and what roughly you were going to get because the, the economy is dynamic and prices are going to change. So if you have some of those third-party utilities that are going to allow you to do some of that stuff, 
um, you know, you can kind of plan a, a, a little bit more casual approach without actually having to sit there twirling your thumbs in game. So when you guys set a start time, you can just get going instead of spending a whole lot of time planning. So hopefully that kind of helps you get a better idea. Uh, Zipiro says, question, I sort of feel like the Reliant is an upgraded line of ships over the Avenger line, uh, which was originally agile and kind of fast while being able to carry cargo. This made it very attractive at first. Um, but then it started to receive nerfs with every patch, and now it's really going down the path of a slow mini hauler that relies on armor to tank damage, according to CIG's wording. Um, the Reliant feels like what the Avenger was supposed to be. Can you compare the two? The, okay, so with this, the... Avenger is really more of a fighter at heart, and it really actually, I think it flies pretty well. A lot of ships saw differences in the way they actually flew, and the flight model's continuing to change. And we know we're getting a big one in 2.6, so everything's going to feel a little bit different. Um, if you've flown the Reliant at this point, you'll know that it, it is not replacing the Avenger at all. Um, it, at least from the uh, flight model perspective. It's kind of slow, it's not real agile, um, it's just kind of clunky to fly. It's a cool ship, and it's got a lot of value in the universe in my mind, but it's not necessarily necessarily a, a dream to fly. Um, I think the Avenger's pretty predictable. It's got pretty good weaponry on it. It's got versatility as far as the uh, modules that you can throw in the back. Um, but the, the Avenger has the ability to do cargo, but I would never have put it in a cargo category. Um, you know, even the uh, Titan, which can carry it in the back. The Reliant was always sold as a mini hauler, as well as a pseudo starter. So it's more of a direct upgrade to starting ships like the Auroras and the Mustangs. That's where the comparison should really be, even though in price-wise it's actually pretty close to the Avenger. They take very different roles in what they're trying to do, um, not to mention the fact that there's several Reli uh, Reliant variants out there, and that's going to kind of uh, dictate what some of the different options are with that ship. But I don't personally look at the two and say that they're in direct competition, unless you look at them both from the mini hauler perspective, in which case it's kind of a toss-up, but I mean the Reliant should probably do a better job in that category just because I think it should end up being able to carry a little bit more cargo at the end of the day. Um, you know, And then as far as some of the other options you have available, um, you may be able to equip some of the news van stuff on there or some of the research things on there and you kind of get more of a modular platform. And when you look at what those different var uh, variants on the two ships do, you're talking bounty hunting and uh, electronic warfare when you start talking about the Avenger line and you're talking about um, exploration, filming, and um, well, I guess it's more research, filming, and combat on the uh, Reliant platform. So they're pretty different in what they're supposed to do, so I don't really look at them as being really com really competitive with each other. Uh, the Veggie Dude. Hey, STL, I've bought a 315, a Freelancer Dur, and a Buccaneer. I'm somewhat doubting my purchases of the, uh, the 315 and the Dur. Um, they should be comparable in what they can do in the verse. Any thoughts on how they differ, and if they are similar, what to do with the 315, as I do intend to at least keep the Dur for potential multiplayer reasons. I was planning on perhaps upgrading the 315 to a Reliant Send to spread between the research and the discovery tasks. Thanks for the info. So, the 315 and the Dur are both essentially... Uh, exploration ships. Um, but when you look at what they're actually going to be, the Dur is a little bit more versatile because it actually has the cargo space in the back. You also get the ability to bring more passengers along. Um, I'm expecting the Dur to be longer range. I'm expecting the Dur to be, um, you know, uh, I guess have better sensors. Um, you know, it's basically a direct upgrade in my mind over the 315. Now, the 315 is probably a better dogfighter in a way, as far as flight model is concerned. But the Freelancer line's no slouch there either, and actually brings better weaponry to the fight. So I look at the Dur and say, if you really want to focus more on exploration, the Dur is a much better option than the 315. Now, this could all totally change, because the 315, and actually the whole 300 series, is destined for a really major rework. Now, that's mostly going to be changing the interior of the ship and probably the overall usage of space, not necessarily components on the ship. So when you compare the two, it's more like pseudo-starter exploration and mid-range exploration. And the Dur is a ship that should be able to be done very capably as a one-man vehicle, even though you can bring more people along. So since you have the Dur in your fleet, it's not like you're comparing a 315 and a Carrick. You know, if you had those two, I would say, well, do you want to go out alone or do you want to go out with buddies? Because if you want to go out with buddies, you know, then you, you do use that ship at that point. But if no one else is online, then use the 315. 
This is comparing two similarly kind of mid-range sized ships. So as far as I'm concerned here, I think that 315 for in your situation should probably end up being melted. Um, you know, I think potentially grabbing the Reliant Sin is an interesting option. Um, but I think it just depends on what you want to do. I think you've got flexibility there and it's essentially credits that you can use in whatever way you see fit. But if you've got an interest in that science, um, it's a really good way to kind of get um, into that. You can experiment with it. You can see if you like that game style. And if you do, then you can all of a sudden start saving up to buy an Endeavor where you could throw on the science modules and really get crazy with your stuff. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, in your case, I would get rid of the 315. Uh, Brain Crack says, hey, Youngblood, uh, do you think the release of the Buccaneer means CIG has given up on the Cutlass fighting capabilities? Haven't found a statement that says otherwise yet. No, um, I don't think that. I think it's a sign that they're changing what the Cutlass is going to be in combat, though. Um, you know, the Buccaneer has a ton of weapons. It should be very fast. It should be very agile. It should not be very durable. I think what you're going to see out of the Cutlass is a, a slower craft, not quite as agile, um, though I don't expect it to be a slouch in that regard either. I don't think they want to pull away from the ability to be a nimble craft. Um, I think you're going to see the fact that it does have a lot of hard points on it with some decent size, um, you know, meaning that it's probably going to kind of live in that weird category between a fighter and like a gunboat in a way. I don't put it in a gunboat category but it does have a lot of hard points meaning you can throw a lot of whatever you want down range so it's really more of a change in how it's going to go about fighting um you know i think when we initially got the cutlass as far as a pledge ship way back in 2012 or whatever it was um the ship itself was kind of designed to be or said to design to be really agile and i mean you can look at the co the commercial you know it's supposed to be kind of a break dancer one that's able to uh, outmaneuver anybody and do a lot of damage and almost be a pest the ship just grew it's too big for that um and i think it's just going to have to adapt in how it's doing its fighting but it, the purpose of the ship is a multi-purpose ship but also one that's capable of doing like piracy um also one of being in combat and because of that it's just going to have a different way of going about its fighting at this point uh, Ragantu says, uh, hey, I'm interested in knowing two things. Which ships do you think will be the most popular when the first year, uh, based on price and which, uh, based on preference, regardless of price, essentially what people will buy versus what people will want to buy. Um, what people will buy, I think you're going to see a lot of people that, because the majority of the players out there have an Aurora. I mean, most people get in with their starter ships. Now there's a ton of people out there that have spent a lot of money on this game and have a lot of different ships in their fleets. Um, but that being said, the majority of players have the Aurora. So I think the most common ships that you're going to see purchased are probably in like that freelancer size. Um, you know, maybe even the Reliant category, but honestly, probably like the freelancer, the Cutlass. People are going to want to do direct upgrades to whatever they're doing. So if they enjoy doing some cargo missions, I would expect to see people buying, you know, a, a, a freelancer. Um, if people find out that they've got the Aurora LN and they prefer doing combat, they may upgrade to like a Gladius. You know, like those types of things. It's going to kind of follow the line of what people want. Want to do now as far as what people want to buy regardless of price i mean there's a lot of people that are going to look at capital ships as being an end game so ships like the um you know the idris ships like the polaris ships like the javelin i think there's going to be a lot of people that have their eye on that prize even though it is going to take a very long time um some people are also going to kind of find that balance of trying to figure out what they can operate solo through some trial and error, and then we'll probably pick a, you know, based on who they're playing with and how often they have friends online, we'll then make a decision. So, you know, for people that are playing with three to four people, you know, they may be shooting for a constellation. For people that tend to play with seven or eight people, they may be shooting for a merchant man. Those are the types of things that people are going to have to take into consideration. It's not only how many people they're playing with, but how much money they're making and what they want to do in the verse. Um, Yapancho says, uh, question, now... Now we know that Stanton is finished at the end of the year. How will they make it the other 99 systems within a reasonable time? That is my main question right now. So Stanton is going to be mostly finished at the end of the year. Like 3.0, um, as we saw in Gamescom presentation, is going to have most of Stanton implemented as well as actually Levski, which is actually supposed to be in the Nix system, um, implemented within the Stanton system temporarily so we get to see a different landing location. Now, the key is, yes, it's taking a very long time to get Stanton together, but Stanton's also kind of a test bed. It's a proof of concept. It's also their design document in a way. They're figuring out how to build stations. And with some of the releases that we've actually just seen with like Around the Verse, they're going through and figuring out ways that they can actually populate um, planets. 
And right now what they're doing is they're actually taking these like prefabricated buildings and they're kind of customizing them on different locations on the planets. And that's very time consuming. But as we go forward, they're probably going to let procedurally or procedural generation kick in and start to design planets based on some of the design decisions they've made elsewhere. And I think that's going to really help to speed things along. They're figuring out the mechanics and how to make everything work in Stanton. And then as they start to move out, the combination of the expertise that they've learned, having a test bed of, uh, or I guess a uh, repository of assets that they can use and procedural generation, all three combined is going to mean that things are going to start moving a lot faster as we expand. It's not going to happen overnight. There's still going to be, need to be an artist touch and all that, but it's going to be better than what we've seen today. And the last question today is a patron question from Clemorelli. Uh, just a reminder, if you guys are interested in having your patron or your questions answered a little bit faster or just interested in supporting the channel, please feel free to go check us out on Patreon, join up. Um, but uh, for Clem's question today, he says, The much hyped and barely alluded to VoIP system seems very interesting. Are you hoping for something like the voice chat in modern FPS games or a more channel-oriented system akin to those uh, dedicated in sci-fi and used in aircraft? I am 100% more interested in the latter um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, I, I want to see channel-based things for one because I want to be able to just communicate with um, like a certain... I want to be able to just like hail my engineer. You know, if I'm, if I'm piloting a very large ship and I need to uh, allocate powers differently, I don't necessarily want to yell over comms what I want him to do. Um, I also don't want a situation where I'm playing with my thousand person organization and all of a sudden it, everybody's chatting and we can't hear over each other. That's a problem too, whether you're coordinating um, you know, an attack or working within the ship. So I think there needs to be several different comm layers. Person to person comms. I think there needs to be inner ship comms. I think there needs to be um, command comms. You know, so if I'm leading an operational you know, expedition or you know, just an, an operation, if you will, I want to be able to talk to everybody in the fleet, but I don't necessarily want to have everybody in the fleet be able to talk back because then you've got a thousand people talking over each other and that becomes very hectic. I think it needs to be very dynamic in how these things work. But the other side of that is I think there's a potential interesting gameplay mechanic there with ships like the Herald. You know, is the Herald able to actually listen in to conversations that are happening on other ships? If it can sit there with all of its systems powered down with the exception of maybe it's like Comaray, and it's able to listen to conversations on your ship, it can gather that information and then sell it at a later date. Now, there's probably some interesting and questionable mechanics that are associated with that. So I don't know if it's actually going to happen. And what I'm talking about is like privacy things. Now, I'm not necessarily expecting like PII to be included in these conversations. I mean, that would be a pretty weird thing to include. Um, but, you know, there's questions there as far as actually monitoring people's conversations without their consent. So I don't know if that's going to actually happen in the game. I would actually be surprised if it does. But it would be at least a cool mechanic if they decided to put something like that in there. So I, I, I think there needs to be a much more dynamic system than what we have in FPS games today. Um, but then I think we also need to be, like when I say person to person, it's not just person to person on my ship or person to person in my fleet. It needs to be able to be, a ship is approaching my convoy. I need to tell him, you need to get the hell out of here because if you continue on this vector, you're going to be engaged, like those types of things. So um, it needs to be a lot more dynamic and I think it's going to be and I'm excited to see what they put into place. So that's going to be it for this episode of The Inbox. I appreciate you guys watching. As always, get your questions in if you have them. Otherwise, stay tuned for more content coming your way soon, and have a wonderful day. Take care.